Our speaker today is Tim Lyons, who's a, a distinguished professor of biogeochemistry at UC Riverside. Um, many, many accolades, fellow of GSA, AAAS, AGU, Geochemical Society, uh, has been the recipient of the Arthur uh, L. Day Medal from GSA. Um, uh, and he got his uh, bachelor's degree at School of Mines, master's at Arizona, and PhD at Yale. Um, and uh, today he's going to talk to us about um, uh, four billion years of persistent habitability on a dynamic early Earth, uh, and so connections with a lot of the themes of CPSH. So with that, I'll let Tim Lyons take thank, it away. Thank you so much. Um, so can you hear me if I move away from my computer? The mic yes, there are microphones. Yep. And it's all linked. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Now I got it. So it's really a pleasure to be here. Thanks for that. And and how fun to see Sean. Are you remembering the connections? I was trying to remember. It's either Seth or or oh oh I was on I was on Seth. And That's I was on chair today. Oh yeah, yeah, I was, yeah, 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 yeah. It wasn't one six five. Sorry, as an ODP, it's like yeah, there are lots of hats to survive in the world, right? right. Basically, yeah. and so one of the hats that I wear is um, is 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 increasingly trying to use the lessons that we've learned from places like the Black Sea and the and the modern Carioca Basin. So I I did my dissertation in the modern Black Sea, but turned out to be so fortuitous because it, it, it turns out to be the kind of environment that has dominated most of the oceans over Earth history. Um, that is anoxia, uh, plus or minus hydrogen sulfide. And that was just luck. And then the allophilic meteorite happened and the astrobiology program took off. And uh, so then I increasingly started getting money uh, from NASA rather than, as well as NSF, but the, the NASA portion of it became larger and larger. So that finally about six, um, seven years ago, I took my first step um, as a leader to get funded through the NASA Astrobiology Institute. And we were successful in the first try, I'm happy to say. It's our alternative Earths group and it has it had lots of great people and, and it still does. And I'll tell you what it's become now. But the, the central theme remains in what we're doing now. And that is using what we're best at, understanding Earth history by looking at modern systems and all the different tools across geochemistry and biology and everything that you need to bring to bear to try and uh, explore histories that are elusive, right? very old rocks that don't give up their secrets easily. And, and what I always wanted to do, and I think this is a lesson for people who are thinking about these sorts of things, is that you know, NASA is a mission-driven um, agency. We all know that. And, and I think in astrobiology, there's been a lot of slack cut for how relevant a given Earth-based, whether it's an analog or otherwise, Earth-based study is to NASA's mission, which is to try and ask biology specifically to try and find life elsewhere. And so we waited until we had what we thought was a portfolio of experience and numerical, analytical, et cetera, to be able to speak in a meaningful way to the search for biosignature gases around exoplanets. And so in our NAI team, we, uh, we really just sort of talked about being able to do that. We didn't have any astronomers or planetary scientists as part of the team. In our ICAR team, we do. So we've complete, completed what I call the vertical integration from proxy-based perspectives of early Earth that feed into numerical models that uh, for ocean chemistry, see genie modeling, et cetera. And then ultimately we take it into the atmosphere, do photochemistry, radiative transfer models that generate synthetic spectra, and then ultimately telescope simulators so that we can say, would methane be detectable in the mid would methane have been detectable in the mid-proterozoic on Earth if you were looking at it with James Webb? for example. And so we can inform telescope designs and what our real strength is, is interpreting data. So as data come from web or otherwise, especially next gen things that have been called for, including direct imaging that have been called for in the new detail, there will be wonderful gas compositions from planets. And, and we all know that the greatest fear is the false positive and false negatives are also a concern. How do you know that oxygen on that planet around an F star at one bar pressure has anything to do with life? It probably doesn't. When does oxygen relate to life? And methane is really my favorite thing. How do we know methane? There are nine fundamental processes, abiotic, that produce methane. And so it's this understanding of what can do it and what can do it to, the great, to, to a great enough abundance that you could actually see it. And so the, the newest thing that I, I've been doing is sort of extending this perspective of Okay, that's a concern. No, but there are different ways of doing that. Let me try. There, oh, there we go. 
I'm not sure why that was so delayed, but there we go. Okay, so this is our new one, alternative Earth. When you have a brand, you stick with it, right? And so it's how to build and sustain a detectable biosphere. So what are is a holistic planetary system sense. And I don't mean just the planet itself, but its planetary neighborhood, uh, the frequency of impacts, a point that I'll make a lot in this talk, all the different pieces of what it takes to become habitable. But, but what I'm going to talk, talk about today in particular is something that is really, really new for me. And so it gives me the luxury of speaking about things that I don't know that much about. So you can't hold me to every detail, but I'll try and, I'll try and make it accessible because I think it's something that's been um, really sorely neglected in this idea of using alternative Earths, the chapters of Earth history, sustained habitability. Um, it's been neglected in, in, in all of those things as we think about, in particular, exoplanets. And that's, and that's actually the origins of life. And so it's fine to, find, to, to discover planets, uh, and we're finding them faster than we know what to do with them now. We're over 5,000 in the planetary count. As my friend Stephen Kane says, that probably every star has planets around it. So there's not going to be a shortage of samples. Uh, the challenge is going to be to interpret those, the data that come from them, and to pick the right targets. And so my argument is that one of the principal forms of, uh, one of the principal criteria that we should use as we pick targets is not just that it's in a habitable zone, that it has either inferred or detectable liquid water at, at its surface. That's just the first step. Water doesn't mean that there's life. Um, and so there is then choosing a target that would allow life to sustain at a level that would, that would impact biosignatures in the atmosphere. There are surface pigments in the ocean, but mostly it's gonna be gases in the atmosphere. And so what we don't ever talk about is, given what we can infer from a distant planetary system, what its history was like relative to its star, relative to its neighbors, what was it like in terms of generating life? Because to get to a detectable biosphere on Earth, it took a lot early on, and then it took billions of years of evolution, uh, including a wide range of microbial metabolisms. That, and that's really what we're talking about, microbial metabolisms that release products, gases that are detectable. Um, and so, so what we've been trying to do is identify planetary conditions that can or cannot give rise to life's chemistry and thus inform the exploration of life throughout the universe. It's just our oldest alternative Earth. That's what I could say, the idea. Let's think about what Earth was like then. What did it take to generate life then? Even if you don't pick a favorite origin of life model, I try not to do that because that is incredibly contentious. <laughs> Unbelievably so. So I try to stay out of that mud. And I say, generally, are there common themes of what you might or might not need? Oceans, land, what do you need? What are the sort of universals? And then as you start to pick a favorite model, you know, whether that's possible on a planet or not would dictate whether your favorite model is possible on that planet or not. And that's true within our solar system as well. And I'll talk a little bit about that. If it's a water world, yet your favorite model requires land. If it's Enceladus or Europa, how do you have wet dry cycles? Are those important? These are the kinds of things that we're increasingly asking. And so beyond habitability, consider the long-term sustainability and detectability of life and its origins. And as I said, it's our oldest, our oldest alternative Earth. And so the reason I got sucked into this is like, you know, as you get older, you have to figure out new things to do to stay interested. And so I was asked to be part of one of the new RCNs, relatively new RCNs. So the NASA Astrobiology Pro Institute has been sunsetted. Not without controversy, but I think it was for the best ultimately. And whether you like it or not, it's been replaced by these five research coordination networks. And uh, one is Nexus, which focuses on exoplanets. There's NFOLS, which focuses on biosignatures. Uh, there's prebiotic chemistry in early Earth environments, which is the one that I'm involved with. There's Network for Ocean Worlds now, principally in Enceladus, Europa Lake driven water world type scenarios. And the very newest one, which just launched, is LIFE which goes all the way from early cells to multicellularity. So as I like, I'm on the steering committee for that one. As I like to tell them, um, they're only dealing with 4 billion years of Earth history, right? <laughs> so good luck with that. And one, are, one of the things we're trying to do is, is really bridge all of these things in a cohesive way. And I didn't say it um, on previously, but I meant to, that uh, what we are now is, um, this is our ICAR team. So it's not really renewal, it's not viewed that way, but I, I took the lead with a, uh, some extraordinarily, most, extraordinary, mostly former students and postdocs. So Noah Planaski at Yale was my student. Stephanie Olson at Purdue who was my student. Chris Reinhardt at Georgia Tech, and some and some other folks. And we're sort of carrying that, but now we have we have lots of planetary presence within it, including 
very strong connections to the virtual planetary lab at University of Washington and Vicki Meadows and bringing all of their numerical abilities and trying to marry our strengths with theirs. And so PCE3 is pretty cool. Um, and so uh, if you get nothing else out of this, um, you'll try to tap into some of the things that PCE3 is doing. We have a lovely seminar series. We just had a workshop. We had another workshop before that uh, a year or so ago, and their talks are available online. They're fantastic. It's, it's really a fundamentally different way of thinking about the origins of life. And, and that has been embraced by many people and by the old guard, and you can you can name who they are. I'm not going to use names, but you know who they are. You know, they're pretty recalcitrant to change. And so they have their favorite models, and they would rather not have to think about whether their model is consistent with what the Earth was actually doing at a given time. And that's entirely true. It's entirely true. And, and I'm, I'm not trying to be glib here, but it's like, you know, when you don't know anything about a particular time in Earth history, you can say anything. But in fact, we do know more about the idea than people claim. And so that's really what I'm going to do. I'm going to address some of these fundamental properties of early Earth that may or may not be conducive for particular models for the origins of life and whether it all works. And so the goal, as I said, is really to uh, is to investigate the delivery synthesis and beta small molecules and their formation really into protobiological molecules. We're not really taking it all the way to cells or metabolism. Some people would like for us to do that, but we're, we're not doing that right now. It's these precursor molecules going from simple to complex. However, they're formed, however they get there, and we'll talk about that. And, and what this is really the, uh, the take home message here under the conditions of early Earth. So we're in essence providing boundary conditions for your favorite model, or even more importantly, your favorite experiment. If I'm going to try and do phosphorylation in a lab, how high do I have to put phosphorus? And is that realistic? And we'll talk about the phosphorus problem quite a bit. So, improved understanding of the origin of light may help guide the search for life beyond Earth. So I would just say that if you're going to target a given planet, and there are many planets, but at the end, telescope time is expensive. So Webb is not going to look at that many exoplanets. So all these different filters are going to be applied before somebody is successful in their choice. We'll look at Trappist, but beyond that. And, uh, and so I, I would just put on the table that the long history of the planet that can be inferred from what you know about its, 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 its solar system, its star relationship, the metallicity of that star, all the different pieces of information that you can bring. Does that seem like a place where life could have begun as much as we understand the beginnings of life? And so I won't go through all of these objectives. I think I basically made the case that we're trying to understand, we're trying to marry prebiotic chemistry, which is mostly done by chemists, um, to an understanding of geology. Uh, and these are not communities that have historically um, talked to each other. If you've gone to the Gordon conferences, you know that it's just, it's just very polarized. Um, it, it, there's no doubt about that. So the story really begins um, very early in Earth history, about four and a half billion years ago, with our, our moon forming impact. And one of the things that you'll get from, uh, from all of this is as you think about our planet, you know, we're writing a paper right now. It's like Wally Broker famously wrote a book called How to, How to Build a Habitable World. Ours is, uh, ours is basically this sort of the same thing is how do you build and sustain a habitable planet? And, and, and in many respects, I would say that Earth is really sort of perfect for this. If you were just to design, if you were given all the ingredients possible and you were to pick those and create a recipe for a habitable, sustainable biosphere, um, you would probably come up with something that looks like Earth. Um, and there are ideas of hyperhabitability, but we come pretty close to that. And one of the things that you'll get from this is sort of the luck of what it is to be Earth, the contingencies, this impact. If this impact didn't happen, how different would our world be today? So this is just one example, but, the, but the, this impact in the presence of our moon gives us tides, wet dry cycles, which are considered to be really important in these polymerization reactions and going from oligomers to polymers, monomers to polymers. It affects the length of the day. So there are because you know we're progressively our spin rate is progressively slowing because of crystal interactions, and so there are papers that are coming out now that suggest that longer days may have helped oxygenation of the biosphere, more time for oxygen to be lost from microbial mass before it's all respired during the dark hours. And so there's a really nice paper that just came out about that. The tilt, our seasons. And tidal locking, I'm not sure that our moon is essential now to inhibit our own tidal locking, but there are certainly planetary systems with the presence of a moon and the competition. Uh, between the moon and a planet and the planet and its star, um, that those combined interactions can affect whether or not a planet is tightly locked. If you don't know what that means, it means that I'm just starting to part. You don't know what that means, but it simply means that one side of the planet is facing the, the star all the time. And so 
origin of life, sustainability of life, detectability of life models are really different on a planet that's tidally logged versus not, and so many of them are. It's not as frightening a scenario as you might imagine. So Andy Ridgewell plays with Genie modeling and heat transfer on a tidally locked planet. Heat still moves around a lot, right? The oceans can still flow from the light side to the dark side. And so there are things that are possible that you might not imagine. But these are all really important things to consider. So one of the things that has come out of the increased study of the Hadean, even sort of independent of, of life, is it, just thinking about these earliest chapters of Earth formation and Earth maturation, is that no longer do we view it as this kind of horrible place that's sustained for hundreds of millions of years. In fact, the Hadean comes from Hades, which is the Greek god of the underworld. And so that's because people imagined that it was long, a hellish, horrible place. But more and more data are suggesting, this is a nice review paper written several years ago already by Rick Carlson, that, the, that this core formation was complete very early in Earth history. I'll talk more about that, probably within the first tens of millions of years. Now, core formation is important because it sets the mantle redox, <clears throat> which affects the ability to release methane or not to control the atmosphere. So that's early core formation. The fact that we have a metallic core, that's really important. Crust formation had begun. Probably we didn't have continents. We'll talk more about that. The, out, the atmosphere was outgassing in particular CO2 and N2 at this time. And surface temperatures, shockingly, were probably much closer to present day than people ever imagined at this time. And a lot of that comes from the idea um, that we have evidence for liquid water. The search for life within our solar systems, past and present, and elsewhere beyond our solar system, exoplanets specifically, almost always begins with the idea that there could be liquid water present. It doesn't mean there is life. Uh, it doesn't mean that something is in, that's in the habitable zone even has water. It just means that it could. And if it does, it doesn't mean that there's life, but it's kind of where you start. So it's like following the money, you follow the water. And so some of you will know, many of you will know about this argument. One of the great developments in the past 20 years in studies of the Hadean, and that's the first 500 million years of Earth history, is that zircons that are collected actually from much younger rocks, but are detrital, and probably some of this work was different here, these detrital zircons, have yielded a lot of different chemical archives, but including oxygen isotopes that speak to the presence of a higher sphere. Now, it doesn't mean that it was a persistently large ocean, but it was probably pretty big and it was interacting in subductive like systems to be able to affect zircons that are appearing in sort of felsic volcanics. It was a big system. And so the existence of, of water may have extended, liquid water at the surface may have extended back 4.4 billion years ago. Certainly there's, I think, a pretty common opinion, at least at 4.3. There are some people who would argue otherwise, but this is a growing sense of agreement. But whether it was persistent or pervasive is something that's open to a different kind of debate. Now, one of the critical things then is to imagine, as I mean, this is basic stuff, you probably teach this in your classes, but, but it's worth going over because I'll talk a little bit more about what the atmosphere actually could have been at this time. The sun was only 70% as bright as it is now at our beginnings. And so to maintain a liquid ocean is not easy, right? And so you have to do that with greenhouse gases. And so when you think about that habitable zone in the gem casting sense, it is based on the intensity of the star that the planet's around, its luminosity. It's based on how far the planet is from the star. But critically, and this almost always goes unnoticed, it depends on what you assume about the atmosphere. And so Jim Casting put large amounts of CO2 into that atmosphere when he defined the habitable zone. So much CO2 that we wrote a whole paper about how the, how the outer edge of the habitable zone, which is defined by the maximum level of CO2 where you still get warming. After that, you get Rayleigh scattering. It actually has a cooling effect as CO2 gets higher. So there's a maximum CO2 where you get that, where you get that greenhouse effect. Those levels of CO2 that are used to define now the outer edge of the habitable zone are so high that the pH of the ocean would be so low and, the, and, and, and issues with the hypercapnia, the tolerability of comp complex organisms really come into play. So it would be very hard for complex life as we know it to live in the outer portion of the habitable zone. So we've already written a paper where we define the habitable zone into different quadrants depending on what you want to look for. And the outer portion with the combination of carbon monoxide and very, very high CO2 would not be great for complex life. So that's really important as we think about it. And we don't know very much about this atmosphere. If you go back to Miller and Urey, 
uh, you would have uh, you would have thrown lots of methane into that early atmosphere for reasons I'll talk about. You don't really have methane anymore. There aren't a lot of people that are brave enough, or I'll use another word, silly enough, no, brave enough, because I, I applaud it. I laud the efforts that, that try and track what the atmosphere was at this time. Kevin Zomley is one of the very best of them. You probably know him. He's very clever, a very interesting guy. You're smiling. You know Kevin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And so what Kevin would tell us is that we had dominantly a CO2 and N2 atmosphere early on and probably not methane. And so CO2, these are very, this is very, very early in Earth history. And eventually the CO2 is, is, is drawn down and modulated in a thermostatic way that it is on Earth today through the silicate weathering feedback. So this is the reaction that makes it possible for me to be standing here today, basically, right? That there is a, a CO2 reaction with rocks and the degree to which that occurs is dependent on the temperature. So there's a built-in feedback that keeps us, and that's the extraordinary thing I would say to my students, for 4.3 billion years, we've been within this temperature range that goes from your freezer to your stove top. That's incredible, right? I mean, talk about a great place to live. And so, that CO2 would have been really important, but the question is like, you know, and there's a feedback when it's warm, you get water vapor, which is obviously a really effective greenhouse gas as well. But as that's dropping, eventually methane um, kicks in. And I'm gonna talk a bit about methane because, because it's, it's my favorite gas right now, I have to say. There, if we're being honest, there aren't really, and I said this to someone earlier, there, there aren't that many greenhouse gases, or excuse me, there aren't that many gases, so we'll even limit it to greenhouse gases. There aren't that many gases that are going to be affected by us. We have O2, but we have to process that carefully. We have methane, we have N2O. I can give you scenarios where the Earth could give you detectable levels of N2O because it was reducing ocean early on. But let's be honest, like all the papers come out about, well, what about methyl this and that? And sure, sure, but you know, O2, methane, they're bread and butter, right? And, and they all have abiotic sources. <laughs> And so the idea of false positives is a big concern. And on Thursday, what I'll talk about is the issue of a false negative. So that probably for most of our history, um, you wouldn't have, would not have seen the O2 methane disequilibrium, which is the classic biosignature. Um, you wouldn't have seen O2 for, for much of Earth history, uh, probably not until somewhere in the Paleozoic. Um, and methane, you probably saw in the Archean, not in the Hadean. Probably not in the Proterozoic and probably not in the, certainly not in the Phanerozoic because O2 is so high. So the false negative concept is this idea that you could have life teeming in an ocean. You can, the things we were talking about, you carry out evolving, all this kind of complexity that may be O2 dependent and you might not see O2. So you're, you're, you're missing from the biosignature gases what's going on on the planet. So that could be frustrating, but it also um, demands that we be clever. So this idea of, of abiotic sources, Barbara Sherwood Lawler is part of our team and we're working with her. I don't know anybody who does better with abiotic sources. There are nine fundamental pathways that can produce methane abiotically. And there are tectonic controls, right? So you're thinking about the early earth, like you know, serpentinization is common in converted margins. What if there wasn't modern style plate tectonics? How many of these could I take off the table under a different kind of tectonic or planetary regime? And those are the kinds of games that people who think about these things that are schooled in tectonics and evolving tectonics can really bring a lot to the table. The idea of an oxidized early mantle seems pretty important in all of these conversations. Also important in these conversations is the idea that, they, that despite all of these abiotic possibilities, that there are increasingly studies suggesting that abiotic methane is produced pretty sluggishly. Right. So, so think about that. Let's imagine that we have the right kind of tectonic style and we're producing gas, methane. It's released from the, in the interior and it's, it's venting into the ocean, into the atmosphere. But it's ultimately down to the flux, right? The fluxes are what's really important. It's not what pathway is present, it's, it's how much it's doing. And so the flux has to be high enough that it actually can go into an atmosphere that has no ozone shielding during the Archean and during the Hadean because there's no oxygen or no O2. And so the photochemistry is really aggressive as it is in our atmosphere today. And so you're losing methane very quickly. And really what you have to ask yourself is could abiotic sources that may have been sluggish source methane at a high enough level with high enough fluxes so that it could build up to levels that could be detectable? And the answer is probably no. Uh, if it is true, then it's something about tectonics or this that we don't understand for the Archean versus today. And that's really how these conversations go. And so, the Hadean, I think, is particularly relevant in this regard because 
what we uh, understand is that the core formed very early, and I'm not going to go into the details. I don't really have any took my time for half the isotope system to set up the presentation. But I love as I learn new things, right? And basically what happens is that hafnium is decaying, to, hafnium 182 is decaying to tungsten 182 with a very short half-life, about 9 million years. So it's gone very quickly. With it, it inherits primordially when the earth forms. And so it's pumping out tungsten 182. And, um, and when the core forms, it sucks tungsten, because it's a siderophile element, it sucks tungsten towards the core. And so if you look at mantle rocks today and you have a, a supra-chondrite 182, 182, 184 ratio, it means that there was continued production of 182 through hafnium decay after the core formed, right? Because otherwise it would have been sucked there and you have very low levels of 182, but we don't. So it means that hafnium was around because it has such a short half-life, it must have been really early for it still to be around. So it puts a time scale of core formation on just tens of millions of years. Remarkable that we can do that, right? So that's what I say, like, what do you know about the ADN? We know when the core formed, right? In a pretty legitimate way. And so that just talks about that. But why is that important? Well, because it kind of takes methane off the table. It really takes Miller-Urey off the table in a conventional sense. They created an atmosphere that they put in their little jar that actually wasn't realistic. It had a lot of ammonia, which is photochemically destroyed quite easily. They put methane there, which is probably not the case for these reasons. And so it's sort of lost favor. And what I'm going to do at the end of this is bring it back to the table a little bit. Suggest that uh, through impacts, you might have at least had transient methane atmosphere and Miller-Urey type atmosphere conditions, even during the Hadean. But the general idea is that we had a CO2 N2 steady state Hadean atmosphere through volcanic outputs. People don't really debate that. If you need nitrogen for life, then you have to figure out how to fix that. You can do that with lightning. Eventually, you can do it with life. Maybe by 3.2 billion years ago, there's suggestions from isolated nitrogen isotopes. My former postdoc, Aiden Stukin, has worked so much on that. Uh, assuming the mantle oxidation state has not changed, and there's a huge amount of debate about that. And there has been this conventional wisdom that it hasn't changed, and now new data are suggesting. So that's still on the table. But assuming it hasn't changed dramatically since core formation, it left the upper mantle relatively oxidized, which means it was not fluxing copious amounts of methane as people once imagined. And so the lack of a Miller-Urey atmosphere um, becomes an issue if you need methane to keep the planet warm, if you need methane to produce prebiotic compounds that are then fueling potential biological synthesis. Um, but here's the thing that's become popular in the, just in the past couple of years is that impacts could produce methane. The idea is that if you have an iron-rich impact or the iron reacts with water to form FeO and, and H2, it's the H2 that's important. The H2 reacts with the abundant amount of CO2 in that atmosphere to form methane. So I, you know, all excited about this, but then I was just talking to someone and they said, well, it's not clear that the iron would have been doing the right things during impact. So I'm working with Swiri people, Simone Markey and others about what an impact would even give you in terms of iron and, and its reactivity. Uh, but that methane could, in theory, produce prebiotic molecules. And so these are, this is a new paper, relatively new paper that, um, that, so look at the time scale here. This is just a million years post impact. He modeled it under a lot of different scenarios, different size impacts. You can play with the compositional differences of the impact, the iron abundance within the impact. But the bottom line isn't really going to change. That methane appears transiently and it disappears in less than a million years. You get a haze associated with that. Uh, and you can get, you know, the nitrile compounds, hydrogen cyanide. You can get some of those building blocks for the development of prebiotic molecules. And so that this kind of impact-related shift in the atmosphere and the related molecule molecular formation has now factored prominently into Steve Banner models and other people who are trying to get to these compounds. In that case, ultimately working towards an early abiotic RNA, uh, which is, we can debate whether that's the right path to be going or not. Uh, but, you know, that's, this is, it depends on how often you have these impacts and how big they are, but they could just be pulses of Miller-Urey. Is that, is that the right kind of origin of life scenario? That's for other people to discuss more than me, and, and I guarantee you they, they are. And so then as we think about methane, as we move forward, the, the antiquity of, of methanogenesis um, based on HGT, horizontal gene transfer, genomic techniques generally is pretty early. It's sort of Luca-like, and it goes back probably almost 4 billion years. But as we were talking earlier today, just because you have organisms that are producing something doesn't mean that it's abundant, right? So there are fundamental pathways. One is CO2 reduction. The other requires acetate. 
acetate requires biomass and organisms that are converting that biomass into acetate. So there's sort of a whole chain of metabolisms that are required to make methane abundant. Uh, but certainly organisms were probably around for, um, for the latter portions of the Hadean and into the Archean. There is a mass independent sulfur record that has been famously the smoking gun for the absence versus rise of oxygen in the atmosphere. Mass independent sulfur fractionation, which is a wonderful story in its own right and, and a really important isotope story of the past 10 to 20 years, it requires a reducing atmosphere and methane is usually ascribed as the driver of that reduction in capacity. So it's sort of the presence of myth implies that there's some methane um, and how much we can debate. High nickel abundances, it's an indirect measure, but but volcanism during the Archean, and you know better than I, was dominated by chromatiites rather than the salts, less, less um, differentiation going from the mantle to the volcanics at the surface. And those chromatiites that were common during the Archean because the earth was still hot, and again, there was less differentiation that's associated with cooling, those chromatiites pumped lots of nickel into the ocean, which is enzymatically essential for methanogenesis. Right? And, and you can look at iron formations where the iron oxides scavenge metals in semi-quantitative ways. And you actually see a shift as you get later from nickel rich iron formations to nickel um, deficient iron formations. Sulfate and oxygen. Oxygen is, is a destroyer of methane uh, in an oxic atmosphere. It's only 10 year residence time today. Another thing that people don't think enough about is sulfate. When sulfate is present in the ocean, what happens is that a lot of the labile organics are consumed by, by sulfate producing bacteria. They get more energy than methanogens. It leaves less of that organic material for the methanogens. And then, of course, sulfate also drives anaerobic oxidation of methane, so that today, much of the methane produced in the sediments never makes it out, right? It's just point of that SMT, sulfate methane transition within the sediments. So I, I think the point of this slide is that, you know, be really careful about saying, oh, that's fine, we have methane. And that's kind of what Jim did. I don't think he meant to launch that ship for decades, but it's sort of like, well, it must have been methane in the Archean. You have to think about what the evidence is. The only real direct evidence, in my opinion, is that you have light carbon appear appearing in, in the later portions of the Archean, which are consistent with assimilation of methane by organisms and the oxidation without a trophy that gives you light DIC, light carbonate rocks, light carbon. And so we do see sort of smoking gun for methane being present, but that's not until the later portions of the Archean. So be careful about what you assume. Because what happens is that you know it becomes a runaway train. It's like, well, methane helps us with the greenhouse. It was CO2 in the Aden, it was probably CO2 in the Proterozoic and Phenerozoic, but let's make it all about methane in the Archean. That's kind of what happened. And the Proterozoic, Paleoproterozoic, snowball earth glaciations were ascribed, have been ascribed traditionally to the rise of oxygen of the Great Oxidation event, destabilizing methane, sending us into at least a transient deep freeze. So all these different pieces then are built in this. I don't want to call it a house of cards, but it's, you know, it, it is a little bit, right? And so there is this idea that an abundance of methane led to titan-like hazes, organic hazes within the atmosphere. Now, those hazes actually cool, so there's a feedback associated with that, but there is also self-shielding, so as the haze forms, it blocks UV, so it allows for some preservation of methane because of the shielding effect that's associated with the haze. So you get these kind of steady-state conditions, um, and this is the way, you know, when I talk to the press, which is what we love to see, it's a green ocean because it's dominated by reduced iron rather than red ferric iron and this orange atmosphere. So we may have had orange skies and green oceans or not, depending on how much methane was present at that time. And all I'm asking you to say is keep an open mind and say, well, maybe there wasn't that much methane. Actually, how do we know, right? You always have to go fundamentally back and ask these questions. So I'm not going to talk very much about this. I, I talked to, um, this is like, you know, what you might use for an intro class. The Miller-Urey experiment, when I learned about it at the Colorado School of Mines, there's not a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of literature taught at the Colorado School of Mines, but I, I took a, a, an English class, but what we focused on was this book by Jacob Bernowski. Some of you will know this. And in that in that book, I learned for the first time when I was 18 years old about the Miller-Urey experiment. And as somebody who was raised a Catholic, but had sort of, had not sort of, but had completely rejected that, you know, I wrestled with these basic ideas of, you know, where do we come from? We still don't know where we come from, really. We don't, right? And so this thing, right, is like, ah, okay. It may not be right, but now I'm seeing possibilities, right? And that was that was really transformative for me. And, and, and so now Miller... Maybe if they were both alive, they'd be happy to know. Neither of them are. 
And you know, Yuri didn't win his Nobel Prize for this. He won it in his 30s for stable isotope systematics. He was smart. <laughs> and so this is a, this was really formative for me. And, and so much of what I'm going to talk about now is a, is really driven, really all of it is in many respects driven by the notion of the RNA world, which is kind of dominating the origin of life community. There's sort of two primary camps. It's the RNA world, Steve Benner and others. And then there is um, the deep sea bed community, and that's Mike Russell and others, and they don't get along so well. <laughs> Say lovey, but it's you know it is what it is. And so the RNA world is it's a really elegant idea, right? Because you basically need enzymes, you need proteins to generate energy in a cell, and um, and, and and that's fine. So you need the proteins, but to form the proteins in a repl replicating way, you need the the, the genetic information encoded in DNA with RNA acting as the intermediate. And so that was that was the chicken and egg, like how you, they need each other, which came first. And so the idea was that RNA could fill that gap because certainly it can carry genetic information, but there was, you know, I mean, you will know, there, someone wanted to know about price for this, right? The discovery that, that RNA can catalyze reactions. It can function like a protein. Who was it that won that? You know what I'm talking about. I don't know. Anyway, yeah, look it up. But anyway, that's a that was a big deal, and it has set the course for a lot of this kind of research. And so, what PCE three is trying to go from do is go from these precursor molecules that can form in the atmosphere, could be delivered by a meteorite. There are different ways of getting these, um, and to the monomers, and ultimately to the polymers. And we're trying to do that within a framework that involves an understanding of atmospheric evolution. And I've already told you, you know, that we know something about atmospheres at these times. And I didn't go out on some crazy branch and say uh, way out on a limb. That's pretty reasonable stuff. And one of the biggest points, if you take maybe one other thing away from this, is the importance of impacts. Uh, I'm convinced that impacts do at least 10 different important things that are favorable for the beginnings of sustainability. Like we all think about the KT impact and the extinction associated with that, but impacts also do good things. And then also this idea of, of a continental crustal evolution. When did we have continents? When did they become stable? And the most important question and a hard one to answer is when did they become emergent? When did they stick about sea level so that you had land? When did you have land? And that's really important because there are many, many models. And, and so this is one of those kind of semi-universals that run through, not all of them, but a, a number of the models. And that is the importance of wet-dry cycles, the idea of wetting and drying and through that process of repeated wetting and drying, there could be events, the storm, uh, it could be tidal cycles, it could be seasonal, there's a wet season, there's a dry season, it could even be deliquescence, the absorption of water, water vapor from an atmosphere and then a release of it. It is widely regarded as a mechanism for driving condensation reactions where, where you can get longer, more complex biopolymers out of, out of simple molar, uh, monomers and, and, and ligamers. And so experimentally, you can demonstrate this. That's what this is. And there are many people have done analogous to reproduce these, re these, um, these results, where you take it in a synthetic system and you wet dry, wet dry, and look at the products. And you, seeing, you see increasingly complex large molecules through those polymerization reactions catalyzed by the, by the wetting and drying. So, you know, again, being the guy from the outside, I'm saying, well, there are a lot of things I don't understand, but if wet dry cycles are important, what does that say about water worlds and icy moons? So what's the what's the way of dealing with that for something or the or the hydrothermal vents, subaqueous vent community? How do they deal with that? And they have ways of dealing with it, but you know, this is essentially if we all agree that that's essential, then then should we be looking for life on Enceladus? I'm not saying we shouldn't, but these are the kinds of things that you Yes. Okay. And so this is one of the one. Of, if we're being honest, also one of the really fundamental questions is when did land, when did continents first form, and when did they emerge? And so I've been looking at these curves, and, and this is June Coronado. So I've been, you know, getting the latest every time a new one comes out. This is fraction of continent crust relative to today. So that's where here we are today at one. And so look at these are all different respected models. So some favor very early formation or a plateau going back to Dick Armstrong's early work, but there are other people that have argued that. Others think that it was a progression of continent formation through that time. When it became emergent really depends on how you deal with mapper rheology and buoyancy issues and June and others do that well. But there are tremendous numbers of uncertainties. And so there have been some new ideas that I really like that have been put on the table 
What Joe likes to argue for is because he thinks that even if there were continents, that they wouldn't have been emergent in our idea. So his idea is that mantle plumes may have given a small, but maybe semi-persistent Hawaiian island type um, islands. It's land, it's above sea level. Uh, you could do it in a stagnant lid kind of scenario. You don't need modern plate tectonic styles. Um, the other thing that Simone has been pushing is impacts. So impact in a big enough impact in a shallow enough portion of the ocean would give you crater topography that could stick up for extended periods of time. So there are ways of getting land even before you have anything close to modern style plate tectonics. And so we now know between lunar crater chronologies and the models that are associated with that, we can look through time with some amount of certainty at um, the abundance of impacts and make estimates of the sizes through time. When you get to the Archean, you actually have records of the impacts with spherical layers. And so it's not, a, it's not a robust record, but it's there. And so I, I, uh, I can talk to you more about this, or I can even post this talk, but this is the list. Every time I listen to someone talk, I add another range for this, but impacts to liver organics, light elements, water, a lot of light elements are concentrated beyond the snow or frost line of the outer solar system. So we have to bring them interior. Uh, crater topography, the reducing atmosphere, maybe at least a transient, Miller-Urey. Greenhouse warming associated with the gases that either are lost in a preferential way through an impact or created reducing gases because of the scenarios that I've been talking about with the iron rich impactor. UV shielding that might come from a haze uh, related to methane production or enhanced release. Hydrothermal activity. So this is guiding a lot of the research in Mars, the idea that, that impacts can stimulate hydrothermal activity. And we can model those activities and imagine what deep biospheres might be like associated with those hot fluids. The ejected weather is easily, so there's CO2 relate regulation that comes with that. Um, and this is one of the big ones right now is the possibility of delivering reactive phosphorus, the, the P problem, the phosphorylation that is required in the RNA model. And so you're smiling, you probably have your own opinions about this. Muted impact of the late heavy bombardment. When I first started doing this work, everybody said, well, the late heavy bombardment basically undid everything that happened before that. The late heavy bombardment isn't really on the table anymore. There was probably a peak of impacts at about 4.1, but it was certainly nothing like sterilizing scenarios that people imagined previously. So the LHB is not really a favorite concept now within the community. And, and I tend to think of more rather than the deleterious effects of impacts, the positive. And so where does this all go as we think about exoplanets? Well, if impacts are really important for any subset of these, re of these reasons, then as you're looking at as an exoplanet, you might think about the planetary neighborhood. Is there likely an asteroid belt? Is there a Jupiter? Is there a gas giant that controls to such a large degree migrations of planets inward and outward that so profoundly affects the numbers of impacts that we've had through time? Did that planetary system go through something similar? If these things are important, they have to be important on some level. And so you can get enhanced release of gas through an impact. Uh, Simone has talked about that quite a bit. I'll just very quickly talk about this. One thing that th these effects of impacts extend even into the Archean. We published a paper in Nature to Science uh, last year where we talked about the great oxidation event being at least in part related to a decreasing frequency of impacts. And you can model that. It was independently predicted. And I'll show you very quickly the plot for that. It's based on lunar chronologies and spherical layers. And so the basic idea is that impactors can, can consume oxygen through because they're reduced materials. So the rocks can weather over, slow, over a prolonged period of time. But they also release gases, volatiles, that can on a shorter term consume oxygen. So these are sources of oxygen sinks. And for anybody who's thought about Earth's own oxygenation, you know that most of the discussion is about the time between biological production about 3 billion years ago and the balance between production and the sink terms related to hydrogen, this and all these other things so that we sort of tipped towards the persistent accumulation of oxygen. So it's about the source sink relationship. And as we went into the GOE, what the data are showing increasingly is that they're really dynamic. There were whiffs of oxygen, the mass independence of fractionation came and went. And so as you go from a trace gas to a more abundant gas, you might imagine that it was very volatile for a while in that transition. And so this, these are just the data. This is basically based on models, based on lunar chronologies. These are the data from the spherules. And you see that the mass of accretive material for Earth is decreasing about right, right about where the GOE is. Now, that could be a coincidence, but it's intriguing intriguing enough to get into nature chief science. And that's really all that matters. <laughs> and, so, and so as we think about 
as we think about it, and I'm getting close to the end here. Thanks for your patience. As we think about these molecules, the RNA world, it is so interesting. Like, I, I wish I were still the fly on the wall. Now I've been the fly who's been thrown into the room, but it's like to see these discussions. And so, you know, if you assume that the RNA world is 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 gospel, then you know it really affects how you think about everything else. And and that's true for any of the models, absolutely. And so. RNA is needed in this scenario because it's formed abiotically and it set the stage for everything else. That's the basis of this, of the RNA world model hypothesis is that RNA needs to be produced abiotically on early Earth in this scenario. And so what this group with David Catling um, and his student Nick Wogan and, and Kevin, this is well, David and Kevin do a lot of stuff together, is that a lot of it starts with the formation of nitrons. Okay, so you need nitrogen because you need those nucleobases, right? And so you can get hydrogen cyanide and cyanide saline and other carbon hydrogen nitrogen compounds that form in the atmosphere. And, and you can do that through impacts, right? So you can do it with a reducing scenario. Now I put these next couple of things up because they're complicated, <laughs> not, not, not despite them being complicated because this is what it looks like, right? This is the world I stepped into, right? Which you see the network, next one, which is just an incredible network of reactions, like the pieces that had to have come together. So it involves a large impact that's giving us that transient reduced atmosphere. There's lots of UV, so we have the right photochemistry. Here, nitriles being formed. Uh, there's exposed land. They want to have the, uh, the polymerization reactions going on. There's also a repeated involvement in Steve Benner world of boring. Right, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And that does stabilize the sugars, ribose in particular. And it also um, perhaps makes phosphorus more reactive, which is really at the heart of one of the biggest problems. This is another chunk of like, wow, you know, like somebody's dissertation might be that, that step, or that step, or that step. And so here we're going from ribose, and there's phosphorylation, and there's the, the, the bases. Um, these are the bases for RNA. And then eventually you start to get. You go from, uh, from from the bases to nucleosides to nucleotides, and then you start to assemble the nucleotides into nucleic acids like RNA and DNA. And so that's really where all of this is going. Lunenberg, I don't talk about, that's a boron compound, and it has phosphorus as well. And you can see borate appearing in various, various places here. And so the phosphorus problem is really, as it turns out, one of the biggest issues. And, and this is where like ge geochemists, like people like you and I who think about the modern ocean, Phosphorus availability is considered a limiting factor for many scenarios. So it's limiting in terms of biological production in the ocean over geologic history, but it may have been a limited abundance in terms of those initial reactions that I just showed you. That's phosphorylation, where you take a nucleoside and make a nucleoside. You have to react to phosphorus. And the problem is that phosphate, the dominant form, which is PO4, 3 minus, is really unreactive abiotically. Life uses it, but it's really unreactive. So people do one of two things. They call upon very high concentrations of phosphate. That's what they do in the lab, like millimolar levels, right? Even though in the ocean, it's extremely low. Somewhere it says that up here. Somewhere in the ocean, it's, you know, it's in the ocean today, and probably over most of Earth's history, it's limited to micromolar levels, in part because it's reacting with calcium to form appetite when it gets too hot, right? So there's a, a mineralogical control on how high phosphate can get into the ocean. And so where does it say commonly use molar, not even millimolar, molar ratios of phosphate? It's just not going to happen, right? So, but that's what you do in the lab. And then you say, but that's not going to happen. And so, and so what people have done instead is called upon other mechanisms. And I won't go through this in detail, but one of the, one of the very popular ideas now is that you have this mineral Schreibersite. And Schreibersite is an iron nickel phosphorus compound. And so it, as it says here, has been found high, to be highly reactive when wet at Schreibersite forms hydrous activated phosphate capable of forming key organic molecules. So the phosphorus in this mineral, when wetted, can actually do the abiotic reaction. Right? So what is Schreibersite? How much of that do we have? Well, Schreibersite is actually relatively abundant in meteorites. So there's an impact scenario. The other thing, and this is a paper that just came out recently, it's, it, it is associated with lightning strikes. But you see it in fulgurites, which are these few silica features where lightning hits the ground. And if you look at them in uh, detail, you also see Schreibersite. So, you know, it's this question of like, it could be that, but could that ever have been abundant enough to drive the origins of light? But there are ways of getting this mineral from space or from lightning strikes on our own surface that give rise to a, a phosphorus bearing compound that would be reactive enough without ridiculously high concentrations to support the phosphorylation reaction. 
yeah, it's time. I don't let me go super quick. And so one other idea is that um, Kathleen and, and his uh, former student Toner argued that that maybe life began in alkaline lakes. And so in alkaline lakes, calcium carbonate forms, it pulls down calcium, and therefore phosphate can build up because it's not reacting with the, with the calcium. And then finally, we can talk about borate. It might sti sti stabilize ribose, that sugar that's reacting to ultimately form the re um, nucleotide. Um, it can also it can also assist in sort of the reactive availability of phosphorus, and that's really what this says. So this is the mineral that they love, lunaburgite, which is a magnesium boron, boron phosphate mineral, and that has been demonstrated, I think, fairly convincingly, to have a stabilizing effect for the sugar, the ribose that's required in our RNA production. And also through mechanisms I don't fully understand, that phosphorus can become available in a way that's more reactive other, compared to free phosphate to, to dissolved in the ocean. And so the final questions, then, and this is just like, I think a good example is like, well, okay, but what is the earth doing at that time? Is it consistent to have had enough of this, this mineral to drive this? Is boron in the ocean principally present as borate or some other form? Uh, what can we tell by just doing some simple sort of back of the envelope calculations? And one of the things that's been popular now is looking based on CO2 estimates for the atmosphere. It must have been high, especially if methane wasn't high, to maintain in the face of a very faint sun early on to maintain liquid oceans. And so the best estimates put pH in the early ocean uh, much lower than they are today. Today, they're around 8, 8.1. Um, and so it puts them down to six and a half, six. So an acidic ocean, and for any of you who have taken my geochemistry class, you'll know that other people are coming up with similar models. So anyway, you look at it, probably we're gonna have a pretty acidic ocean early in the history. And if you've taken my geochemistry class and learned about acid-base reactions, you'll know that at, uh, at low pH, borate is actually vanishingly small and it's mostly present as boric acid. And so I, this is not the kind of chemistry I do, but when I ask specialists, I say, well, will boric acid do the same thing that they need um, relative to borate? And they say, no. So here's just a simple, I, I'm not sure that's true, it, but it probably is. But here's a simple, a, a simple conclusion based on an, a reasonable estimate for pH that borate may not even be there. The other thing is that it also affects the solubility of, of calcium phosphate and the ability of calcium to pull out phosphate. And so at high, excuse me, at low pHs, appetite is actually more soluble. So that may be a way of ramping up phosphate. The point is that even during a time in our history where we think we know almost nothing, we can come up with reasonable estimates of pH and what that might do to chemical constituents that we think are fundamentally important in these reactions. And so in the final slide, and thank you so much for hearing all of this. Um, as we address this question of whether we're alone, uh, I think it's maybe it's not the central driver of that conversation, but certainly an important part of that conversation is how does it all start? How did it start on our planet without making any assumptions about one model over the other? If we think about all of them being on the table, which planetary situations far beyond are favorable for one model versus the other or none at all? Just stop there. Thanks. All right, we're at time, but I, Tim, are you still online? Uh, yep, yeah, I'm here. Okay, great. Um, we're right at time, but maybe we could just take a couple of quick questions. So if anybody online has a question, either uh, speak shout up. out or uh, whatever. Right. If you want to put it in the chat, I can read it out or you can unmute. Uh, could you just read it? That would be great. Yeah, yeah if, if you have a question online, just put it in the chat. And then I'll start off with a question in the room. Mm -hmm. So meteorites are an interesting question, right? Because there's this question of iron, there's this question of nickel. Both of those can be rich even just in the chondritic ones. Right. Um, and also amino acids. And so has there been so many recent studies of sort of fluxes and whether any of these are high enough to reach? Yes, the, the answer is yes. And so, I, you know, it's again, when you step into something that's new, you find the people who know things you don't know. And my, my meteor, my impact, person is in Simone Marti in Boulder. Okay. Yeah. He's he's really, really smart. If you don't know him, you should. He's really good. And so Simone has done as well as anybody in terms of modeling total impact fluxes through time. And it's not just magic, right? We have lunar chronologies, but we also know the history of our solar system. We know the distribution of materials in the, in the solar system today. We know how that would behave in response to the distribution of gas giants we have and how they may have moved. But there's, so there's this whole idea of, of planetary migration moving in and out. And, and it can explain, for example, in 
other planetary systems seeing things like hot Jupiters, right, that are too close than they should be because they probably migrated. And so, so that really affects things. And, they, and these very sophisticated models give us, and I didn't show it, but he could give you a whole talk on estimating fluxes. And that's part of that Archean story that you see it tapering off and maybe magically, maybe coincidentally, but maybe in some significant way, that taper occurs right at the, at the GOE. Mm -hmm. So they can take that all the way back to the AD and, and probably in some ways even easier, right? As they think about the land accretion, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so, so not only do we have a sense for that, but they also can make compositional estimates. And what Simone has done, and he's waiting for me to complete the same calculation for molybdenum, but he can show that Archean impactors delivered one single impactor of reasonable size for that time period can deliver many times the total nickel inventory of the ocean because nickel is really abundant in them. So you can start to ask questions like, you have methanogenesis here, but it's a proliferation of methanogenesis some way aided by like an almost instantaneous mega blast of nickel. What's really interesting for me related to that is molybdenum, right? So nitrogenase, the fixation of nitrogen, um, the really the dominant pathway is a molybdenum base. There are alternative nitrogenases that involve iron and vanadium, but molybdenum is what's dominant today. And if you look at the nitrogen isotope records going back to 3.2 billion years ago, they seem to be based on, on molybdenum-based nitrogenase because the fractionations are different depending on what the metal, metal cofactor is. That ocean had almost no molybdenum in it, right? I mean, that's my work, right? We look at shales through time and and it was an anoxic ocean. The weathering of molybdenum sources on the continents were low. The anoxic conditions sucked it down. And so I, you know, my estimates are that it was vanishingly small in the ocean, yet molybdenum nitrogenase seems to have developed. So maybe there was an external source. Greg Fournier says to me that if, you know, if, if life inherited the ability to use molybdenum, his term is it would hold on to it. There's something molecularly favorable about having that nitrogenase. You're not, and you know this better than I do. And so, so maybe all of these things, it's like you know all the iron dependence that we have in life today in an ocean that has almost no iron, right? These are vestiges of oceans that were very different. And so possibly there's a pulse of molybdenum that was inherited and, and retained through time. It seems to be an undeniable fact that nitrogen fixation had an important role for molybdenum through most of Earth history, even though it may not have been abundant. So that gets back to your question, like these, these external deliveries, I think are a new frontier in this. And certainly nickel uh, is easy to do. Molybdenum, he gave me numbers. I have to calculate how it is relative to the ocean. Network. I have a yeah, question. Yeah, of course. Um, so you talk about habitability and like how we can use my uh, metabolism, my metabolism that produces compounds that can be detectable in the atmosphere. Right. So based on that um, assumption, what would be and talking about methanogenesis and using acetate and H two and like how it's important to consider organic matter to produce acetate. But do you have any? idea or is a possibility that rather than using acetate or H2 in methanogenesis, there's, 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 other, there's other compounds that methanogenic are sure. now are using instead of uh, sure. acetate, right? So if we're thinking about astrobiology, we think about how we have uh, like so, other so, planets. I, sorry, I made to interrupt, but I know where you're going with this. Yeah. So, yeah, so all those things are possible, right? I never take things off the table. Yeah. I'm just saying that if you're going to assume this versus that, it carries with it ancillary assumptions, associated yeah. assumptions, right? So if you look at the atmosphere of that planet that has CO2, then CO2 reduction is likely. If you're assuming that acetate is a principal driver, then you're assuming that there's biomass. You have to think about what that biomass is. That's a big question on Earth, right? We have yeah. all these metabolisms, but sulfate reducers weren't filling the early ocean with organic matter. Yeah. Oxygenic photosynthesis was, right? And that didn't really occur until about 3 billion years ago. So there just simply may not have been biomass, or it may have put a demand on a different pathway. So let's say that you look at your world and there's no option, but this is, you know, that's why it's so fun, right? Because it's all BS, but none of it's BS, you know? It's, 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 it's the most creative ground I've ever traveled in. Yeah. I sit and talk about this with my sons, right? It's really cool. So let's say there's no oxygen. Well, maybe the sinks swamped that, but you might see that in hydrogen if it's a big enough planet, it's not lost from me. You might see those sinks. But if there's no oxygen, maybe oxygen and photosynthesis didn't occur. Um, and so then there's, then there's not the biomass, right? And if there's not the biomass, what's driving 
what I mean, yes, we're taking Earth like models, but Earth is behaving like a chemical physical system, right? It's not like we're going to go to some other people always love to ask me this. What if we go someplace and it's just completely different? Well, the rules, the rules of the universe apply on some basic level, right? Yeah. Carbon is abundant, is there are many reasons for basing life on carbon. Yeah. Uh, life is always going to need energy. There are you know, basic ways of doing that. And, and so, you know, so, so if there isn't the telltale sign that there's a major production of biomass, um, then, and, and yet you're seeing methane, how's it being produced if there's no CO2? Um, if it's not those, could it be another pathway? Is there, if it's another pathway, what do I look for to fingerprint that? So I'll give you an example of that kind of argument. Around M stars, you get planets that are near M stars have multi-bar levels of O2. Like, yeah, read them. Has nothing to do with life. It's all CO2 photochemistry. Mm -hmm. And associated with that process is a lot of carbon monoxide. So if you see, and we we're talking about with biomarkers, you know, if it's this, there's often something else. And so you look for the something else. And so the fact that it's there in that planetary context, the concentrations are so high, and we're seeing the carbon monoxide, it's actually fairly easy to make that false positive go away. Yeah. So that's really all I'm saying. If it's something else, then you have to think about what you would look for to identify that versus something else. It's possible that we'll never know. But if it's abiotic production of methane, then you have to maybe go after this idea of why is it producing so much? Yeah. And, and you can estimate what the UV flux is. You can estimate whether it should have a long or short lifetime in the atmosphere. If it's way far out, maybe it's better than being close to the star. You can start to do those things. It's amazing the people that do this stuff for a living, what they come up with. Like, you know, I can come up with it, whether a planet is might have a, a metallic core and there's a whole issue of magnetic field simply because when you identify a planet in transit, you get its size when you do it in radial velocity. So you would do both for a given planet, you get its density or you get its mass and the, ma the mass and the size gives you the density. So if it's, you know, if it's this size and it has that density of X, then it speaks to whether it's rocky, whether it has a metallic core. Once it has a metallic core, then it speaks to some of these processes, so the possibility of a dynamo. Does it have a dynamo? Well, one of the big questions is, can we come up with an estimate, and I throw this at my exoplanet people all the time, with internal heat production? That's such an important part of our planet, right? That's why we have plate tectonics. So from the metallicity of a star, can you start to estimate fluxes of materials that might be radioactive to generate internal heat? So I think ultimately one of the big prizes will be more sophisticated ways of looking for tectonics on, on exoplanets, because phosphorus on our own planet mostly is sustained through tectonic recycling. It's either the weathering of the seafloor, which is a new I, I argument, but that still requires resurfacing the seafloor. It still requires seafloor spreading, or it's uplift of phosphorus-rich material in the mountains and, and weathering that. So if we didn't have those processes on Earth, we wouldn't be here. Right? Nitrogen is 80% of our atmosphere. It's easy to suck nitrogen out. But phosphorus is limited, right? And so if you don't recycle, then you don't, then you don't keep things going. It's so, Tim, is there anything online, or should we probably uh, hey, well, what you call it? No, not, nothing online here, and uh, I actually have to run, but I made the astronomy class post, and so you can end the meeting um, from there. All right, I think we're good to go. Okay, so thanks sounds everybody. good. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for a great talk, Tim. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Bye, all. I'm going to cut it out. Thanks, everybody. I'm not running anywhere. If, you're, if you don't have to run, you can ask this. Is there another room in this? Oh, I don't know. They can wait a little bit. Go ahead and ask me a question. Yeah, yeah.